Side Story is a musical that I think everybody knows to an extent. You're either super into musicals and you know it because of that, or you've heard a song here and there like I Feel Pretty or America, or even if you're only into classical music, you've surely heard the mambo, which is played by a lot of orchestras. But what I don't think is that widespread is exactly who the composer behind the music of West Side Story was, who Leonard Bernstein was. And I mean this literally, since a lot of people seem to think it was Stephen Sondheim, but Stephen Sondheim only did the lyrics. And a lot of people that do know that Bernstein wrote it, perhaps are not aware of the massive impact that he had in the conducting world, in the composing world, in America as a society and in the world of classical music at large. So I want to quickly tell you the most important things you should know about him, which are the areas in which he had the biggest impact in conducting, composing, in television, why I like to call him the first YouTuber, hear me out. Now for this, I went a bit nerdy and I read the most amazing compilation of letters between Bernstein and other people. If you're at all interested in this or in the music of the time, read it, it's on script and you will find jewels from Carlos Kleiber, my favorite conductor, asking him for an autographed CD of West Side Story to give to his kid so that his kid will like him more, to Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, writing him a letter that starts with, do you remember me? I am now 10 years old. If you're new here, my name is Anna and I'm an orchestra conductor. And in the end, I will, I do want to share some personal thoughts about how my appreciation for Bernstein did a complete 180 in the last couple of months and you'll see why. Now, if you know a bit about classical music or if you watch my videos comparing conductors, then you probably know Bernstein as a conductor. He was one of the most influential conductors of the last 100 years, extremely famous, uh, you know, well-respected, but his break into conducting was like a lot of things in life, sheer luck. Of course, he was extremely prepared, talented. He had studied in Harvard and in Curtis and played the piano and etc. But he was at that time an assistant conductor and assistant conductors were very unlikely to conduct. It's not like now that you get, you know, family concerts or smaller concerts in smaller venues. It was only, you know, you would only conduct if someone went sick and that very rarely happened until one day it happened. And it was none other than Bruno Walter, which I have mentioned in this channel because he was the student of Mahler. So that is one degree of separation between Bernstein and Mahler. Bruno Walter, who was to have conducted this afternoon, is ill. And his place will be taken by the young American-born assistant conductor of the Philharmonic Symphony, Leonard Bernstein. But he did it brilliantly, it was a huge success, and he became very quickly very famous. People wanted to write about him or interview him because he had a lot of things that were in a way a novelty at the time. He was only 24 and at the time being a young conductor meant that you were 40. 24 was like being an embryo conductor. It didn't exist. He was also Jewish, which at that time was a very sort of complicated and tumultuous time to be Jewish and so much so that his mentor, his conductor that was mentoring him, urged him to please consider changing his name because he thought otherwise he would never be successful. And then he proposed to me the nom that I should change it to, which was Leonard S. Burns. I lost a night's sleep over it and came back and told him I had decided to make it as Leonard Bernstein or not at all. But he was also most notably American. They were not that many, if at all, well-regarded American conductors. There was just not a tradition. It was a very sort of new thing to be coming out of America. Most conductors that were respected or that had positions in theaters came from Europe. And all of these things make him sort of like the exception of all the rules personified. So he was instantly very, very famous. He went through a couple of appointments before he got his big appointment as the conductor of the New York Philharmonic, which he would help for many, many years. But as a conductor, the thing that he innovated in the most, that he introduced and pioneered, and that to me is one of the most important legacies, is his work in television. Oh, well, you see, they don't need me. They do perfectly well by themselves. So why is a conductor necessary, after all? At 
that time, 1950s, television was very new. And off the bat, it was considered to be a thing that made people dumb, that made people not think, that had no educational value, that it was just numbing entertainment. And this is why I am convinced that if Bernstein lived today, he would make YouTube videos because he took television or he took classical music into television and television into the world of classical music, a world that takes itself very seriously. He introduced these programs, his TV shows, where he would talk about classical music in a very simplified way, but without making, without dumbing it down, if that makes sense. His first appearances were in a show called Omnibus, where he would also use the visual possibilities of television to visualize what he wanted to explain about music. So here is a clip of him arranging the musicians of Beethoven Fifth on the actual score to explain to people where instruments came in and out. And the thing I love him the most for is the amount of times that he would talk about pop music or rock music, most notably the Beatles, as something that had worth and value, where at the time the Beatles were considered to be dumb music that were making girls go crazy. That was the extent to which people, at least at the very beginning, thought or analyzed the Beatles. This music raises lots of questions, but right now for openers, here are the two that concern me most. One, why do adults resent it so? And two, why do I like it? And in line with this, the other thing he really pioneered were called the Young People's Concerts. And these were concerts for children where he would explain to kids and children and, you know, youth what classical music was about. He would focus on a composer and try and break it down, but he would make it very accessible, but he wouldn't dumb it down. He didn't underestimate his audience. He would go into details. He just found ways to make it very clear. But whatever words we use, the idea of those three parts is still clear and simple. That feeling of balance we get from two similar sections, A and A, situated on either side of the central development section, just as the ears are situated in balancing positions toward the nose. And also one of my favorite things to note is that for this concert, sometimes he would introduce new young conductors and um, see if you can recognize this guy. We're first going to hear our gifted Italian assistant, Claudio Abbado. Yep, that is baby Claudio Abbado, who would then go on to also be uh, one of the greatest conductors that's ever been. The original energizing motor that makes me compose is the urge to communicate and to communicate with as many people as possible. Because what I love about the world and about life is people. Now, originally though, Bernstein really started out in the path of being a composer. And then as his conducting career started to take on, he sort of had to juggle both things at the same time. As a composer, he wrote a number of symphonies, he wrote some operas, he wrote Candida, and he wrote Travel in Tahiti, which I have recommended as a short opera. It's a, it's a really nice 45 minutes opera. But the thing that we all kind of know him for is West Side Story. West Side Story was a project that had to sort of start and stop because of other things that Bernstein was working in, one of them being Candide. And at one point they brought in, and I quote, a new young lyricist named Stephen Sondheim, who is going to work out wonderfully. Apparently it was one of his first works for Stephen Sondheim working with Bernstein. And the piece at the time was called, as you can see, Romeo, because West Side Story is based, it's loosely based on Romeo and Juliet, you know, of two lovers from opposing families, or in the case of West Side Story, opposing gangs. And so they called it Romeo as a working title. Now, West Side Story was a success, first in Broadway, and then it got picked up for a movie, and now it's being made into a movie again with Steven Spielberg. His other pieces, though, didn't see the same amount of fame. And generally, as a composer, he stood in a very difficult position because he was heavily criticized by his peers, by other composers of the time, for sticking to tonality. The general attitude toward me, which is that I am conservative and retrogressive, or whatever you want to call it, 
And that is largely because I believe in tonality. But in his time, the 1950s and 60s, not only were, you know, composers of the time writing atonal music or 12-tone music, they were also, you know, saying goodbye to form, saying goodbye to structure, writing aleatory music, uh, Stockhausen playing with electronic music. It was going in a very different direction. However, on the other hand, he did a very real effort to program a lot of these composers that were very, very foreign for the audience of the New York Philharmonic, from Cage to Morton Feldman to, you know, Stockhausen, uh, Tsenakis. He did really champion as well the inclusion in the programs of American composers, especially Aaron Copland, who is an amazing composer and with whom Bernstein has such an intense correspondence. Again, if you're interested at all, go read it, because they exchanged letters throughout their whole lives but in his very sort of early years, in his 20s, the correspondence has such an intensity, you know, such such expressions of love and, and missing each other that it's just, it's very, very uh, touching and noteworthy. And for some sort of personal thoughts, I guess, for one, I want to say, and I know I've said this like a million times, but if you're at all interested, go read these letters because they felt like I was reading something that I shouldn't be reading. Like it was a personal, the personal diaries of someone that I stole because they were so intense, deeply personal, but also very strong. I don't know how to put this, but no feeling was halfway. It was either, you know, to Adam Copland, like I said, I miss you, I want to see you as soon as possible. Or sometimes when he was talking, to his teachers and he was very young and his future was very uncertain for a while he would very very strongly ask them please call someone and recommend me i really need this he expressed a lot of frustrations about the second world war coming and how that made him feel like perhaps doing music was futile and what was the point and i really enjoy reading these things because a lot of those feelings are feelings that I have, that I know a lot of people have for very different situations, for the pandemic right now, you know, when you're struggling. It's just very reassuring to me to read that everyone goes through a version of all these things, or not everyone, but a lot of people that end up being very successful go through a portion of these things in their lives. And the other thing I wanted to say is, I guess, share with you how my views on Bernstein or my appreciation on what he's done has changed a lot in the last couple of months. I was introduced to Bernstein through his conducting recordings. His conducting recordings, the ones that I've heard, and if you ask me today, 2021, ask me in 10 years, maybe I changed my mind, but they have never been my favorite. There's nothing wrong with them, but they've always been a bit slower than what I, you know, thought the piece should be, or if I compare them to versions I really preferred, they were much heavier, you know, a bit towards the side of, yes, yeah, slower, heavier, more solemn, if you will. The things that I have been discovering in the last couple of months is just how important the work that he did outside of conducting was. How important his, you know, a, a bringing television, marrying television to classical music, bringing young kids into concerts. You know, they said that the concerts, the young, the young people's concerts were sold out, that people were signing in their kids from infancy so that they would eventually, you know, get to go. He was so influential and it was so ahead of his time. Now it's so obvious to us to, yeah, do an educational show, do a talk before a concert. But he had a lot to do with that. And he did it at the time where it wasn't necessarily an obvious good thing. At the time, it was new. At the time, saying that the Beatles were just as good as Schumann in a different way was very new. And in a context of, you know, being the first American conductor, you would think that he would feel like he needed to prove some sort of weight or importance but he still went on and did his work in television and wrote musicals and wrote tonal music. So I find this contradiction, contradiction between perhaps the way he approached his conducting to the way he approached everything else, very interesting. And honestly, in the last couple of months, the more I research about topics, the more I found videos where he's talking about it. 
and I am amazed at the way that he finds a simple way to explain something that's very complex without taking away elements of it. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoy West Side Story. If you are considering seeing the new movie, I am very curious to see how it is. Also, by the by, a little, a little fun fact, it is conducted, the orchestra that recorded this new film is conducted by Gustavo Dudamel, uh, which I find very cool as well. I will link to you a lot of sources that I saw as well as this um, book that I have recommended a million times and I will see you next time.